We have a lot of choices, Johanna, on managing patients with metastatic frontline disease and unresectable. Give me a little sense of how you make frontline treatment decisions. What drugs do you pull off the shelf? What combinations and the like? Right now, what's good about this is I can't answer you wrong. Well, maybe yeah. I could say if I said carbotaxol. But, <laughs> but there's a lot of different possibilities in terms of chemotherapy backbones, in terms of biologic backbones, in terms of intensity of chemotherapy, all of which I think are reasonable. And until we have some data from trials, which I know we'll discuss that are upcoming, that tell us one way or the other, I think you can pick the traditional one in the United States that we use a lot is Folfox plus bevacizumab in the front line. And there's people that believe it. There's people that don't believe it. Fulfiri plus bevacizumab. Fulfiri plus cetuximab for first-line metastatic KRAS. For patients, we just recently saw data that was presented today at GI ASCO of Cape Cytobine plus Bevacizumab. Could that be a, a, a good initial therapy for patients not only who are elderly, um, but for patients who present with, un, with unresectable metastatic disease? And so I think what we need to do is really sit down with our patients who are making these decisions and look at the adverse event profile and look at the toxicity profile. Like, for instance, some patients will tell me, I don't want that skin rash. And those are patients, we treat patients in the first line metastatic setting the longest. So do we want to save that rash until later when we treat them for a much shorter period of time? We have a lot of guitar players in Nashville, so they might want, not want a lot of oxaliplatin. Um, Heinz treats a lot of movie stars out yes. in LA. They might not want to lose their hair. And so I think that's where it comes down to a lot of tailoring the treatment to the patient by the patient themselves in adverse events. Yeah, there are a lot of points I want to bring out on this, but these two guys over here wrote an editorial in JCO huh. last year we did. that uh, I, you know, really altered my practice, so, so thank you. What we went into this is that we could plug and play any of the drugs, that we could, irinotecan and ox were the same, that 5-FU and capecitabine were the same, that EGF and veg. You guys who did it in a beautiful summary, a slide that I now show regularly in my talks, um, basically to me suggested that capecitabine and EGFR mon and monoclonal antibodies may not play so well together. Uh, whichever one, actually. Yeah, I mean, give me, give you know, me your it, thoughts on I, this. I, I do. I mean, it, when the biologics came about initially, we thought, you know, we'd just add it on to all back chemotherapy backbones. We were not very concerned about chemotherapy biologic effect interaction. But I think, you know, the data come about more and more that there is good evidence there is an interaction. I mean, you and the data on especially the EGF receptor antibodies, you know, when you look at the various clinical trials conducted, you know, some of the results are really when you at first glance all over the place, you know, the Nordic study which used bolus 5 few, for instance, the COIN study which looked at two different capecitabine versus uh, infusion of 5 few uh, backbone. And I think Heinz and I, we, we've tried to make sense of, you know, what's available and the data that are available. And I do believe that EGF receptor antibodies do not play well with capecitabine, and they do not play well, well with bolus 5 a few. So, Henning, based on all of this, is this the reason Cairo 2 was negative? Probably, but it's probably not the, the whole of the answer. You know, Cairo 2 was capecitabine oxaliplatin, and everybody received bevacizumab in addition to that, and half of the patient, in addition to this three drug regimen, also received cetuximab. And those who received the, the two antibodies did worse. So, and we have another trial who's uh, confirming this. So, maybe partly this maybe could be explained by uh, the by the interaction of capecitabine and cetuximab, but could also partly be explained by using the two antibodies that are not performing as well. You know, this is our big concern. We always had, you know, we, we had expected that this will be a, a home run, that everything would become better, but it is not. So, yes. Um, this is probably one explanation. No, Axel and I were big fans of the Bond 2 data. We did it in clinic. We saw it work, and then we were discouraged, and NCCN said no more. So, so, so a couple of things, I think, um, and I think that's kind of explaining sometimes the complexity. I think in the U.S. we were behind understanding and using 5-FU. Had to do a lot with the pump and, a, and an infusion. They want to do bolus. It's easier. P patients travel long distances. And I think we know when you give 5-FU bolus, the mechanism of action is different. The efficacy, toxicity profile completely changes. When you compare Folfox 4 versus Folfox 6 or 7 or whatever you do, the grade 3 neutropenia is more half less when you do continuous infusion and not bolus 5 you with it. So obviously when you combine with other drugs, depending on the mechanism, you see different interactions. And I think that's some of the explanations to it. Now, we also have learned that tumors we treat initially or treatment who have vector factor are not the same tumors. 
our treatment changes the composition, cells who survive obviously are not the same who die. So when you treat in fourth line with two antibodies, it's a different cancer you treat than in first line. Now, I personally believe these are more stem cell-like um, uh, populations, and we know these cells are by definition chemo-resistant. Our treatments in third and fourth line, when you look back on cetuximab, the two antibodies, recovafenib, here you see signals with chemo, very difficult, because by definition they are not. So when you inter interfere with signaling, this cancer stem cell work on, then you see me benefit and not in first line. I want to be a bit provocative because I'm surrounded by really smart people, so I want to, want to ask your opinion. All these studies are basically being done in Northern Europeans, right? Where we know across the board, mm. vitamin D levels are low. <laughs> and yes. we also know that vitamin D correlates with that poor outcome. And so we pick on the British, for example, and that their study outcomes are bad <laughs> because they don't have drug access. What do you think might be, just, you know, no one knows, but so it'll give you a chance. You know, is vitamin D being measured as a part of a standard clinical trials now? And maybe should we be incorporating that marker? Axel, what do you think? You know, it's, it's a fair question. And if you talk to Charlie Fuchs' uh, group, you know, at Dana farber they would love to run a prospective trial, actually, using vitamin D as an in, kind of an intervention, okay. you know, to test it like a drug. Um, and actually, this was a proposal on the table, which was turned down by the Intergroup Steering Committee, and we had to then end it up with a trial that we have right now, right. 8702. Um, so uh, is it worthwhile discussing? I do believe so. Is it the whole, can we only, can we explain this whole thing? Uh, you know, these, we have data from Latin America, mm -hmm. you know, where I hope, you know, the sun exposure is better. <laughs> we have data from Australia where they actually have an ozone hole problem, yeah. Yeah. you know, and uh, all these data hold up. I mean, chemotherapy in, works to the similar degree in these, in not just northern, and I do believe that the reason why British patients in, in the UK have a poor outcome. I mean, we can talk at length about this management strategies, but we can also learn from it. And I do believe that, let's say, exposing patients to all active agents and really keeping patients on therapy longer term is probably the way to go. And I want to shift gears to maintenance therapy. And, um, you know, we, we, okay, so we start off, usually I think most of us agree with a combination approach. Um, of uh, what I usually say is taking the legs out of the tumor, get some response. Even in the asymptomatic patient, I will frequently start with a oxaliplatin-based or arenatecan-based, usually BEV, uh, fluoropyrimidine frontline. After three, four, six months, depending on your, your style, um, we have got data that backing off is, is okay. Um, and, um, but keeping something going, at least in most patients, seems to be emerging, this concept of maintenance therapy. We have the uh, so-called DREAM study, we have macro, we have others that are out there. Maybe wax a bit about your thoughts. Yeah, I think one, one reason why maintenance came up is, was because of long-lasting neuropathy associated with oxaliplatin. Yeah? So and the, here, uh, uh, physicians try to minimize the long-term effects of, uh, of, of oxaliplatin and doing a stop and go, or you know, not not as treat as long. Yeah. So my answer to this is, I start with Fury with an IoT can, com containing regimen, uh, and use oxaliplatin as late as, as possible. Uh, this is a regimen where you can continue longer than we can you can continue with oxaliplatin. So that that's one part of it. Um, the other thing is, of course, yes, we don't know about the, 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 the length of a treatment. When we had only five of you folinic acid, the progression-free survival median was six months, which was, uh, was, was uh, nearly near to the duration of the treatment at all. Now we have progression-free survivors approaching 12 months. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the question is coming up, you know, should we treat until progression or should we stop before? What I usually tell my patients is, Plan, we pl are planning a six months duration of treatment and thereafter we negotiate. Mm -hmm. There are some patients who are so worried of stopping treatment that has been effective. You know, doctor, we can't, we can't leave the treatment without, uh, we can't leave the tumor without treatment. And there are others who are happy to be, have a, to be on a drug holiday and do something else. And uh, I try to understand the tumor biology while I'm treating the patient and then start a discussion with my patient whether or not to, dis to continue treatment or not. 
That's not a very scientific approach, I agree. <laughs> no, but it's being a doctor. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's what our job is, yeah, is yeah. using the tools to the yeah. best. Johanna, in, in our world, we tend to be more oxaloplatin, and of course, uh, that makes the decision to back off much easier. Patients are ready as well, and having that discussion right from the front line, I think, makes it so much easier. The patients are like, when are you going to back off? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're into it, for the most part. I mean, there are those that, that are uh, more uh, into it. What do you do when you back off? Haha, <laughs> that's a million dollar question. So I think the first thing that we tell people is we're going to treat them for about four to six months. Get that maximum response potential out. And then what we're going to do is we're going to focus on quality of life. And so what we're going to do is we're probably going to move into a maintenance regimen. And it's interesting because when you look at the maintenance trials that we've seen so far, nothing is very clear in telling us exactly what that should be. What I tend to do is a stepwise approach, and that tends to work with my patients, is first of all taking off the oxaliplatin. Mm -hmm. And usually when you take that first drug away, it makes such a difference to it their does. quality of life. The patients say, oh my goodness, this is great. Mm -hmm. And then keep them on a 5-FU-based regimen, usually continuing along with bevacizumab. Um, but do you switch over to capecitabine and bevacizumab? Do you just do the infusion with the bevacizumab? I tend to still keep them on infusional because they're used to it. They'll come in every couple weeks. But I also make it very clear to patients that if they want to, back off and not come into clinic as much, we can probably space that out a bit. And then for the patients that continue on another four to six months, maybe start to hint to them that maybe we can take out the 5-FU component mm -hmm. and try just bevacizumab alone. We don't know if that's still beneficial. Um, the trials that have been done so far with single agent biologic maintenance have not clearly shown us that that's the right thing to do, um, but I do sometimes do that. We're waiting for the results from the AIO trial. I heard the second, the last patient went in two weeks mm -hmm. ago, um, which will answer that question for us, where they compare bevacizumab plus 5-FU versus bevacizumab alone versus no maintenance therapy to try to figure out how to optimize that for the patient. Are we ignoring the Optimox studies where fluoropyrimidine is actually the drug that kept us up? I mean, I, I personally, I mean, I follow a little bit more or less what, what uh, Johanna said, but I do keep a fluoroprimidine around because the data, if we ever look at data, the data for fluoroprimidines are stronger than for bevacizumab in the maintenance therapy. But I do believe that there is a very strong synergism actually between fluoroprimidine and bevacizumab, stronger than for arenotec and oxaplan. So coming back to if you start with fulfiri, for instance, and I am a strong believer of an induction maintenance therapy uh, say, uh, concept I actually delete arenotecan from after eight cycles of therapy. Why hammer right. the patient to so squeeze out the optimiri? <laughs> but squeeze the last little percentage out of the response yeah. assessment, and and actually a similar thing happened when you get arenotecan off the equation. Patients feel a lot better, you know. And you particularly with keep that KRS a, wild type, you're probably going to bring Erie back. You bring Erie there, back, right? you know. So I think you know whatever sequence we use, I do believe that in the end we. What I tell my patients is my goal is to keep you around as long as possible in good quality of life. Yeah. And I use the least amount of treatment that I consider necessary to control the disease.